Okay, so Roberto Bermarx um, connected with, uh, now I forgot, was he born today or he died today, but uh, he is connected with the third, uh, with the fourth of uh, August. Um, an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, creator. The builder of jungles. Uh, he was described in this way, quite an interesting uh, wording, you know, the builder of jungles. Um, you know, maybe we need more builders of jungles in the world and more Lilith as opposed to Eva, the wild woman, the woman of the jungle in a way. This was the man, but again, is something wrong here. This thing doesn't disappear. I, I, I am irritated. Uh, Zoom, Zoom uh, had some updates. And uh, usually updates mean trouble, you know, uh, if you don't have an up to date uh, machine like I don't, uh, you know, the updates disturb the whole thing. It was fine before the updates and now the updates, this thing doesn't move and uh, I'm, I'm getting agitated. So uh, forgive me if, if uh, not everything, uh, um, you know, uh, goes as smoothly as I would like. I hope you can see him because it's this thing here at the top which doesn't vanish, it doesn't recede. And I, I don't know why. I don't what I, I cannot do anything. <sighs> Technology. Anyway, this is the man. Uh, Copacabana promenade, a pavement. He did pavement landscape, large scale, four kilometer long, four kilometers long mosaic completed in 1970. On, famous, on the famous Rio de Janeiro beach, influenced by Portuguese uh, pavement. pavement. Um, when it's, not, it's not so little, you know, four kilometers. Uh, and uh, he did uh, some remarkable uh, landscape, this, this man. Uh, um, you know, the sensuality of South America is, um, is present in his uh, work and um, uh, he was an artist, of course, and, and, and the, the greatest architects are artists, you know, we might not like to hear this, some of us, but the truth is architecture, if it deserves its name and if it deserves to be in the histories of art, well, it has to be an art. Those who contest it are timid souls, and uh, I think uh, we should protest against the timid souls. Architecture is an art, but it's a complex art, of course. You live within a building, and I don't think uh, Brinkush, with, with all due respect, was right when he said that uh, architecture is an inhabited sculpture. It's not, it's more than that. Uh, it's more complicated, but still, at its best, architecture is an art. You need, a, you need an artist to, to handle forms, to create emotions, to touch the heart of the, of the user, of the one who sees or passes by and so on. To do that, you need uh, the skill of an artist. So he did these things, you know, uh, these are urban paintings on the pavement of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, uh, it's not a little thing, and I, I, I think it's beautiful to be able to use the, you know, the, the pavement of a great city as your canvas, so to speak. Even if you might say only the gods and the birds and the pilots and the planes would see it, but uh, it's, it's, it's more than this. I think that the, the undulating waves, the graphic waves of the pavement inspire these people who go now towards the ocean to use their, um, you know, uh, vehicles. So, Roberto Berl Marx, I, in, in, the, in the invitation I sent out, you know, I, I felt tempted to use just the last name, but the last name had, uh, you know, malevolent connotations for us in Romania, at least, Marx, uh, because uh, the version of, 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 of uh, 
you know, socialism and capitalism that was created in, in Romania um, disheartened us. Although the theoretical work of Marx was different from what was uh, implemented here. Another work in Hotim Brumadinho, Centro Educativo Bar Marx, uh, Centro de Arte Contemporanea. Uh, here you see also this blending between the building and the landscape and uh, the capriciousness, the artistic uh, capriciousness of the artist who played with, uh, with the forms at the top of the building. And again, we need this capriciousness. You know, I call it capriciousness. I could call it in a different way. Um, you know, life is not rational. It's not only rational. Most of the time, it's not rational. And uh, uh, art shouldn't be rational either. Uh, it should uh, express the, the tumultuousness of life and in one way or another. Uh, so, you know, the timid souls and those who life, love greatness, like uh, Lacaton and Vassal, should uh, uh, be challenged for the, by those who love art and love uh, color and love uh, uh, capriciousness, as I call it. Maybe not totally uh, in an adequate manner, but uh, another work in Sao Paulo, this is an older work, 1954. Roberto Val Marx and Oscar Niemeyer. What a beautiful uh, couple here, you know, a great landscape architect and a great architect together. Uh, uh, creating a park, a mixture of, you know, buildings and landscape and trees and, uh, you know, open spaces, uh, paths and so on. Uh, in itself, it's like a, an artwork, you know, if you would exhibit this on a white world, let's say, as an artwork, it would be taken as an artwork. Progetto Original, Progetto Original, 1951, Flamengo Park, large public park in Rio de Janeiro built on landfill. And not for all of them I have a great uh, resolution pictures, but uh, you know, I hope I, 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 I'm, I will be able to convey, at least in part, uh, a path towards uh, uh, an interest for this, uh, for this man. The exuberance of South America is an exuberance which transcends the limits of South America and touches all, us all. And, uh, you know, um, I think we can learn from South America something in the field of uh, exuberance. A hippodrome in Caracas, Venezuela. Truly, without art, life becomes uh, unbearable. We need art. We need beauty. We need non-conformism. We need color. We need shapes. We need the provocations of exuberant and non-conformist spirits. Otherwise, we suffocate, you know, and uh, who wants to, to suffocate? I mean, you see here, it could have been just a plain gray, gray green surface, and but 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 there was a creative man who animated this uh, this surface, and we need that animation. We need that spirit, that human spirit, that that uh, uh, enlivens even inert matter. Parque del Este, Caracas, Venezuela. Look at this. <laughs> You know, I mean, I feel like smiling, like laughing even, you know, it's, it's exuberance here, it's, it's art, it's, uh, uh, it's a creation, you know, it's, it's, it's something that God didn't make. And so it was for man, the created one to make it. And uh, I'm glad uh, he did, you know, uh, I think it's very nice even if it was not built, but I think it was. Look at this. So this was the plan, and these are some pictures. Now Maybe it looks a little bit more interesting from the air, but also it depends on the time of the year, the season, and so on. 
in essence, is about the conjunction between God and man. And they are correlative. Really, they are. I mean, uh, Dostoevsky knew it, and we should know it too. Man and God are correlative. And, you know, that's why I said if God was creative, and he was, and if man is not creative, then we are betraying God. It is as simple as this. And when we see the church betraying God, that is the saddest thing of all. The so-called servants of God betraying God. Like when they don't bury a poor man who doesn't have money for the burial. That's a, in my opinion, that's a crime. And there are church people who do this, forgetting that Christ would probably would have used the whip against them because this is unacceptable. But, you know, anyway, let's not divagate, come back to Berl Marx, Roberto Berl Marx, La Lagunita Country Club in Caracas, Venezuela. Again, again, here is God and here is man. Here is uh, Roberto Berl Marx and here is uh, God. And uh, here is maybe, maybe Oscar Niemeyer. And, <laughs> They complement each other, I think, beautifully. Um, yeah. Pampulha, this is a great work. A com uh, collaboration, again, between uh, Oscar Niemeyer and uh, Roberto uh, uh, Marx. It's a church. A church would, which would make the, the churchmen of our, our country uh, faint. And they should faint because they are timid souls, unable to understand what creation is. This is a beautiful church for Francis of Assisi, built by a creative architect and with a, the artwork of a creative artist who created something new and something original, just as uh, nature renews itself in the spring uh, where we are, art should also announce a new beginning. Not to repeat yourself at infinitum dogmatically, that is not creation. But, you know, the churchmen who are actually full of money and they cover the country with the countless uh, identical churches, uh, dogmatic churches, they don't listen to, they, because they also are not interested, they are not curious. You know, these theologians should uh, open up, you know, let's see what they do in, in Brazil. You know, let's see what uh, Roberto Berl Marx did together with Oscar Niemeyer. Look at this church. Shouldn't the church be the house of God? Shouldn't the church be a celebration of creation, of life, of art, of love? They should be, a church should be, but uh, the dogmatic spirit uh, is so uh, prevailing uh, in our country at least that uh, um, you know, architects don't even study in architecture schools in Romania. Never, they never study the church. Never a chapel, never a meditation chapel or a commemorative park or whatever. Nothing that has to do with spirit. Can you believe it? Five schools of architecture, which prepare hundreds of students to become architects, and they never never ever study once for once the project for a church. Meaning never study something having to do with spirit. For us, architecture is all about stomach, the stomach, meaning the refrigerator, and the pocket, meaning money. Nothing having to do with spirit, with a soul, nothing. Nothing in six long years of study. This is unbelievable. Because Frank Lloyd Wright designed 11 so-called sacred spaces, 10, you know, for various denominations, and the 11th one was a synagogue. Uh, Louis Kahn, uh, several. Uh, Alvar Alto, several. Le, Le Corbusier, four. Even Miss Van der Rohe designed a chapel in Chicago um, on the IIT, uh, Illinois Institute of Technology campus. So, but again, and there is no one here to, to listen to this, this plea to bring back spirit to architecture. There is no one who takes decisions 
in the educational system in Romania who is here now to hear that it is impossible to not have spiritual matters addressed in a school of architecture. It's not possible. It's simply not possible. But this is what is happening. Ay, ay, ay. So then, of course, you know, this church, beautiful church by, by Oscar Niemeyer, is totally irrelevant to us. Who was friend San Francis of Assisi, right? We don't care. Who was this Oscar Niemeyer? Well, maybe we know the name a little bit. But he did this church. Well, you know, it doesn't look like a church. It looks like a factory. Or uh, anyway, Cascade Garden, Longwood Gardens, Pennsylvania. Here, here, here he, here he got wild. You know, I mean, not so much in this picture, but it's it's look at this, look at this uh, voluptuousness of nature that. Uh, uh, Roberto uh, uh, indulge in, you know, it's it's the joy of creating with more than just colors, but with organic matter, and I'm sure it's very very difficult to 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 maintain such a park or garden because you know you are dealing with very sensitive matter with organic matter with nature, you know how do you how do you handle it you know because it's alive. It changes in, in, in relationship with temperature, humidity, seasons, you name it, light. Anyway, he did it courageously. And look at these beautiful plants. Ah, the beautiful plants against the clerical. You know, the morose, dark, stiff, dogmatic clerics. Yeah. Did you see the movie Joanna, The Passion of Joan of Arc by, by Theodore Dreyer? In my opinion, one of the greatest movies ever made in the 20s or 30s is a black and white masterpiece by a great, great Danish uh, film director about a great, great, great young lady, Joan of Arc. Please see this movie, The Passion of Joan of Arc. And you will see in that movie the same acid, uh, intense attack on the clerics of the film director, as I have in my soul too, because, because it is unacceptable what the church does. And not just in my country, in many countries, you know, they have a lot of power. They burned a saint, that's what they did. They burned Joan of Arc at 19, who had the courage to love God against dogma, and they burned her. As someone screams in the film, you are burning a, a, a saint. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. Anyway, back to nature, back to the beautiful plants, back to Roberto. <laughs> Roberto, the great landscape architect from Brazil, who loved nature. That's because he had the soul of an artist. That's why. A boulevard in Miami, completed posthumously, I better not look at it, uh, botanical gardens in Venezuela, sorry for this picture, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, the city center in, in Malaysia. Uh, again, you know, for a landscape architect, is playing God in a way. You are up there in the sky and you, you know, uh, <laughs> in, a, in a majestic way, you handle matters kind of in a godlike manner you know and uh, anyway we need we need uh, landscape designers yes i rush a little bit because we have a lot a lot of material to cover today casa forte square praga the casa forte in uh, in this place in brazil i don't have pictures cascada farm random pictures of his work so you, you forgive me if you can uh, this presentation is a sketch of a presentation but we still salute uh, this important landscape architect on, 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 on a day uh, which was important in his life. Um, now, the rationalist, the casual, uh, not the casual, the one who believes that, you know, uh, uh, there is a cause and there is an effect, 
and then the effect is always the, the effect of the cause, and that's it. It's a linear relationship between cause and effect. Well, what he does here is uh, contradicting that linear relationship. I would say that uh, Bern, uh, Marx, he thinks like a mystic. The cause is the effect of the effect, and the effect is the cause of the cause. In other words, it's a circular relationship between cause and effect. And not everything can be explained rationally from A to B to C to D. No, it's art. If you had this done with the colored pencils or in whatever medium and put it on a wall, it's art. If you had George Braque, for example, exercise himself in landscape architecture, probably you'd have uh, received something similar to what we look at now. What do we see here? We see biology, we see the dynamics of forms which are animated by a vital spirit and elan vital. That's what we see. This is art. It's emotion. And look at this. It's art. As opposed to the dry urbanism, the rational, boring, the deadly urbanism, the so called scientific one. Revisiting the constructed, constructed evidence of Roberto Bern Marx, the New York Times. And anyway, the, this is just a, 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 a website where you can see, uh, you know, other references to his work. Um, so, his name Roberto Bern Marx, a great landscape designer and architect of Brazil. If the person in the lower right corner didn't have so much hair, I would have said that he must have been uh, Kenneth Frampton, the 90s. You know, uh, somehow the, 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 the position and the curiosity of the person contemplating the world made me think of him. So he did all these things, you know. Uh, I mean, this man needed the whole the earth at his disposal to, uh, to do his art uh, on the whole earth, if possible, not just in on the beach of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Some um, artwork by him, he, a self-portrait, I guess. So when he wasn't making things, sculptures, jewelry, theater costumes, hand-painted tablecloths, he was collecting them, a small selection from his significant holdings in Brazilian folk art, much of it Roman Catholic in theme, is in the show. This was an exhibition, I guess, with his collections. In a six decade career, he designed some 2000 gardens, assisted in later years by his longtime associate Haruyoshi Ono. Again, Japan. Many of those plans, though artlessly pursued, were never realized. That's it. So, we go to the next one, and really it bothers me that this thing at the top of the screen doesn't vanish, and I don't know what to do to make it vanish. It, I simply, uh, this is happening because of the the update of Zoom. You know, they they, they exasperate me with their uh, updates. Okay, Pierre Charon. 
Now I can't even, um, whew, the sunlight, okay, slides. Pierre Charot, a strange Frenchman. And uh, I hope we, we, I will be able to evoke why he was strange. Uh, maybe I am strange that, the, that I use the word strange, <laughs> strange in relation with him. 1883, 1950, so he died at 67. This was the man, he didn't have a training in architecture or anything. He worked as a um, decorator in a way, but he built two or three buildings and uh, some very interesting ones. Um, so he began by designing furniture, by designing interiors, uh, until he got a commission in, in, um, in, uh, in architecture, a house for a doctor, which became quite famous. But let's look at some of his drawings first. Uh, this is a, you know, quite an elaborate, uh, almost technical drawing. Uh, this is for the house in Paris. Uh, we are going to arrive at it. it it's a little bit uh, complicated with him because for that house in Paris, which is considered the masterpiece, uh, it's not very clear. He worked with a Swedish young architect and uh, apparently the role of that architect uh, was, was higher or more important than uh, initially acknowledged. So um, I have a presentation on that architect too, and unfortunately I don't, uh, I don't recall his name. And this is really uh, problematic from, from my side, but uh, I hope I will be able to restore some justice by talking about him at some point. Um, anyway, Pierre Charot and the question of, of authorship. Uh, why the question of authorship, as I said, because um, there is some controversy related to his most important work. To what extent he was actually the author of that work. A dealer, Scofidio and Renfro, designed exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York, examines the legacy of the French designer. Uh, dealers, Cofidio and Renfro, they do very innovative um, uh, architecture and also installations. They are hot, as uh, they would put it in uh, New York now. Pierre Charot, Modern Architecture and Design, which opened Friday. Anyway, this, this text is from some time ago. At the Jewish Museum in New York is the rare double show as compelling for the installation by dealers Cofidio plus Renfro, as for the displays of furniture and interiors by the French cult figure who practiced in Paris from the end of World War I to the Depression. The exhibition is the first developed devoted solely to Charot in the United States, where he is known primarily for designing the legendary uh, Maison, uh, sorry for the spelling of the word Maison, Maison de Verre, the glass house on the left bank. The show and very readable catalog flesh out the legend, documenting the design career of a successful architect, Monquet, uh, who failed the exams to get into the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So these are some pictures from the exhibition on Pierre Charot at the Museum of Modern Art in, uh, in Manhattan in New York. Uh, exhibition uh, done by uh, dealers Cofidio and Renfro. It's hard not to be envious of, of this work, highly creative, but this is, you know, this is the result of, 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 of doing creative work. And, uh, you know, uh, those people who say that some people are lucky and some people are not lucky. Well, it's true, luck does exist. Fate does exist. Fate does do its uh, workings. But, but uh, I also think that the so-called luck is sometimes at least the consequence of working towards it. You don't, just don't expect from the blue sky to have luck fall on you. You have to welcome it, to, to, to initiate something, to make some steps towards it. Then luck comes to you probably sometimes, at least sometimes. Anyway, 
this is the exhibition. This was not done by Pierre Charon. This is about Pierre Charon. Of course, to, to have an exhibition dedicated to you in uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York is not a little thing. So the very fact that this exhibition took place shows that Pierre Charon was and is very appreciated. This is an image of the Maison de Verre, uh, the, the glass house, uh, which is a remarkable building in Paris. And we are going to see it in detail a little later on. Charon, who aspired to be an architect, despite his lack of training, practiced primarily as an interior designer. And photographs of the swank interiors he did for Paris haute bourgeoisie show the impeccable taste of an ensemblier, an artist decorateur who, like a set a design, like a set designer, brought together paintings, carpets, colors, wallpaper, and furniture not all his own in fully coordinated interiors. He would have done well doing movie sets in Hollywood. Uh, anyway, these are some pieces of furniture that I guess he did. Uh, but Charot's discreet and limited exercises in metal furniture and armatures hardly prepare us for the Maison de Verre, a full stop masterpiece of machinery and industrial culture designed between 1928 and 1932 for a doctor and his family. In the context of the designer's work, the house emerges as something of a surprise, full blown and mature. It is clearly an inventive original monument of modernity. We learn in the show and in the, the accompanying catalog that Charo collaborated on the house and several other buildings with a trained Dutch architect, that's his name, Bernard Bijove. Uh, he has a little bit of a difficult name for me, at least, uh, Bernard Bijove. But we should Bivoye, Bivoye, But we should remember this this name because he did other things. He was quite a good Dutch architect. The share share between what Charo produced before the glass house. And the sudden advent of this radically complete vision gives a visitor a pause. Did Charot really design the house himself? Did his architectural partner, or was it the result of equal integral, integ integral collaborations, including the one-off work by Talbert? It would be helpful to see examples of other buildings done by Bijvoe to understand what the apparently self-effacing Dutch architect brought to the project. I would agree, a very interesting uh, uh, Dutch architect uh, who worked with Pierre, Ch Pierre Charot on this house. And here you see an image of the house, uh, Maison de Verre, um, the house, the glass house, very different from the glass house by, for example, Philip Johnson that he built for himself in, uh, in the United States. This is in Paris. The catalog itself asks, who actually designed the project? And answers, information is relatively scarce. Uh, the young Dutch engineer and architect Bernard B. Chifouet must have had a significant role. Maybe, perhaps. Maison de Verre, 1928, 1932. Let's not forget. Uh, Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was done in 1928. So it was around that time, but as opposed to Villa Savoie, which sits in a green context, this is a house in the, you know, in the heart of Paris. You know, it, it's, it's in, you know, in the midst of, of, of the urbanity of what Paris means. So this is the house done for a doctor. Of course, doctors uh, usually afford uh, such houses to be, be built for themselves. Doctors, lawyers, and uh, uh, church figures, they are usually uh, the ones who uh, are able to, you know, have the funds to build for themselves or for, uh, you know, in the case of the uh, church figures for God, as they say, things that other people cannot afford. This is an interesting house, though, and it needs um, it needs some some study more than I was able to allocate. But 
uh, you know, like if I am to improvise some reading of the house, what do I see? I see a blending between industrial design and uh, touches of classical culture, you know, visual culture, you know, uh, towards the, the wall, the glass wall, uh, we have, uh, you know, a more industrial uh, kind of aesthetics. And then on the left with the library and the piano and, uh, you know, it, it is as if you move from right to left in this picture, you move towards, uh, you know, the mechanical industrial, uh, world towards a more <clears throat> humanistic uh, kind of world. Otherwise, the building from the outside uh, is like this. Is uh, Maybe its charm and its, uh, you know, provoking curiosity derives from the fact that it kind of uh, questions the predictability of what a domestic house is. You know, like, uh, for example, here, it's not very clear, you know, this is just uh, one tall floor, uh, uh, you know, it could be almost anything here, any kind of function, uh, an atelier or a studio or, you know, you, 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 you wouldn't quite name it a, a house and it's certainly not a gingerbread house. I mean, you know, just compare it with what is behind the apartments in this apartment building. There is clear, we have apartments, but here it's not so very clear. It's almost like there is a public dimension beyond the private dimension, which a house usually means. It, it's, it's, you know, it's an opulent house. It's, it's, it's a house that, uh, you know, I'm sure many people would love to have, but only a, a few can afford. It might be that indeed the touch of the Dutch architect uh, was more significant than it was initially acknowledged. I mean, there is a certain intense modernist here, which maybe does not belong only to Pierre Charot. So this is Maison de Verre in Paris, whose so-called official author was considered to be Pierre Charot. Now there are some people who question uh, the unique authorship of this building. It might be that his collaborator, a young Dutch architect had a, a more significant role, but whatever the building was built. And, uh, you know, uh, we should value it as a, as a creation that uh, maybe had two authors, maybe had one author, who knows? But the important thing is the building, the work that we look at. So here is the, you know, the, the, the office uh, of the doctor. La Casa de Cristal de Pierre Charot. Uh, I don't, uh, it, it was called also in this way. It's the same, La Maison de Verre. Interesting that here you see the name of the Dutchman is placed in front of Pierre Charot. I found this uh, wording uh, somewhere. And this could mean indeed that Bernard Bishop Boe uh, was uh, very important in this project. We see some other pictures here in, uh, in, in black and white.
a quite a you know a clinical uh, i mean appropriately so for the function of this space now he also did apparently this house for an important uh, modern painter abstract painter in in the united states a house for robert motherwell in east hampton new york east hampton new york it just happened that i had a chance to live for two years in east hampton new york i was a so-called artist in res residence at the um, experimental school there and I used to take the bus in the morning to go from where I live to the to the school. And I, I maybe one day I will just dedicate it to the, my East Hampton experience. East Hampton is a is a spoiled place where the very rich of of, of New York live in. You know they go there in the summer. In fact, someone told me that we know when the summer came, when everybody on the streets is dressed in black because that's how the intelligentsia of Manhattan likes to dress like in black. So when, when uh, you know, the streets of East Hampton become uh, black because of the, you know, the costumes of, um, you know, the, of, of the people who animate the streets, it means it's summer because uh, the people leave uh, Manhattan in order to go to East Hampton, South Hampton and Bridgehampton. There are three, uh, you know, spoiled places one near the other. So this house was built by Pierre Charot for uh, Robert Motherwell. There are there houses by Richard Meyer, uh, uh, you know, you name it, uh, Charles Guidme, uh, the, the many, uh, you know, well-known architects built for uh, that uh, those people who like to dress in black during the summer. So this is the house and it's not a bad house at all, I would say. Apparently, also here, uh, Robert Motherwell uh, uh, participated somehow in the design, but it's a it's a fine uh, it's a fine building. I personally uh, uh, admire it for its uh, you know simple, fresh aesthetics. And uh, you know, North America is a pragmatic country, is a capitalist country through and through, but strangely, somehow it also has pockets of resistance, uh, which are, uh, 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 which consist of, of um, you know, intellectuals, uh, artists, and so on. And uh, capitalism knows how to, how to caress a cat to death, that is to put the avant-garde artist, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to silence him or her by paying him a lot. They did so with a very important Romanian theater director, Andrei Sherban, you know, who was a struggling young theater director. And then Columbia University hired him as to be the director of the theater program with a huge salary. And I think Andrei Sherban lost some of his, uh, uh, the intensity of his early years when maybe he was hungrier but um, in a way uh, less, uh, you know, conditioned by the caresses of uh, capitalism. Maybe this is just a, you know, spontaneous reflection on, on how capitalism knows how to handle the rebelliousness of the avant-garde. Instead of throwing, to the, throwing the avant-garde into prison or in the gutter, they buy them. Capitalism buys the rebellious artist and the rebellious artist uh, loses his cutting edge normally, of course. When your salary is over one hundred thousand dollars a month, uh, a year, of course, uh, you know you you have less reasons to to be rebellious. Uh, I, I would say. Anyway, this is the house for Robert Motherwell, uh, designed, I guess, by Pierre Charot and Robert Motherwell. I like the, the artworks of Robert Motherwell. There are some important uh, abstract uh, North American artists who did well, and then uh, you know they became rich, and some committed suicide, like Mark Rothko, and Jackson Pala committed suicide in a different way at 47, I think, uh, or 43, when he got drunk and uh, he drove a car with two ladies left and right, and and he died, they died in an accident. One of the greatest painters of modern North America, Jackson Pollock, and the other great one, Mark Rothko committed suicide. How do you explain it? You know, how do you explain it? These were highly successful artists, able to paint exactly how they wanted 
being admired, being publicized, being bought, having exhibitions. And one died because of an excessive amount of alcohol and the other one died because he, he killed himself. Why did they kill themselves? But I am asking you something else. We all talk, we all know the famous, the American dream, right? You know, everybody talks about the American dream, but let's reflect on something, on something. Two kings and one queen of the American dream who exemplified the American dream at its maximum in a way, died in the same way in their own vomit, in their own bathrooms. I am talking about Michael Jackson. I am talking about Elvis Presley. And I am talking about Marilyn Monroe. I'm talking about Michael Jackson, the king of pop. I'm talking about um, uh, Elvis Presley, the king of, uh, of rock. And I'm talking about Marilyn Monroe, the queen of, sensual, uh, of sensuality of the silver screen. And they all died almost identically in their own bathrooms, in their own vomit. How do you explain it? How do you explain that the apex of success arrived at the despair because in a way they kill themselves? So shouldn't we question the American dream? I mean, we have in this case, two kings and one queen who died tragically, still young, in similar circumstances. And I mentioned before, you know, I mentioned Mark Rothko, who committed suicide, and I, I mentioned uh, Jackson Pollock, who in a more oblique way committed suicide as well by getting drunk like hell, and uh, together with two uh, uh, female companions, they all died in a terrible uh, uh, car accident, also in East Hampton, New York. Anyway, back to Robert Motherwell, the house built by Pierre Charot. Yes, Robert Motherwell, this is not Pierre Charot. Uh, object designs, a few, you know, objects that he designed, Pierre Charot. Let's remember, he started by designing objects. He was an, a decorator and interior designer. He designed some pieces of furniture. We see them here. And interesting uh, aesthetics here, you know, like uh, modern, but uh, with some, uh, ambiguities there is not uh, it's not a harsh modernist here i would say although there are there are aspects of it which would qualify it for almost avant-garde but but not completely not everything I guess he designed this interesting uh, chair for uh, for uh, for uh, Robert Motherwell in this house. Interesting because you know it extends, and um, so there is a you know a certain process involved in the in in in, in the in, in the life of this uh, uh, of this chair. I'm not sure how comfortable it is, this one as well, but uh, it does look interesting. Well, the table is a table, it's not extravagantly different. There are some influences here anyway. So 
from uh, Pierre Charot, we go now to a very interesting North American architect, uh, Bruce Goff, who was born on the same day with Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, or uh, some uh, students or apprentices, uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright called him uh, Frank Lloyd Wrong. Uh, and uh, Bruce Goff probably thought himself that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was sometimes at least wrong because he refused to work for him. Although initially he, uh, uh, he was granted this, uh, this uh, chance. Bruce Goff, I talked about him on the, on the 8th of June because it was his birthday, but he died on August 4th. So that's the reason why I talk again about him. For the people who died, I talked twice on the day of the birth and on the day when they died. So Briskov died on the 4th of August, 1982, at 78. A very interesting architect who never studied in an architecture school. And I read that he actually, when he was 16 or so, he wrote a letter to Frank Lloyd Wright and one to Louis Sullivan, uh, so the to two to the two greatest masters of architecture at the time in the United States to ask them to what school of architecture should he go. And they both, both Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Sullivan told him the same thing, stay away from schools. Louis Sullivan told him, you know, it took me years to unlearn everything I learned in school. And, and Frank Lloyd Wright put it bluntly, if you go to a school, You'll, you'll lose Bruce Goff, meaning you'll lose yourself. So then Bruce Goff didn't go to a school. He just followed his path and he became a brilliant architect and he built a lot. At one moment he was um, hired or was, yeah, he was accepted as an apprentice in Frank Lloyd Wright's office. But uh, after a very short time, uh, Bruce Goff said goodbye to Frank Lloyd Wright and I think exactly then, when he turned his back on Frank Lloyd Wright, Bruce Goff earned the admiration of Frank Lloyd Wright. And they became, until the end of Frank Lloyd Wright's life, friends. And they admired each other uh, openly. And I'll show you a picture of both very soon. So Bruce Alonzo Goff was an American architect distinguished by his organic, eclectic, and often flamboyant designs for houses and other buildings in Oklahoma and elsewhere. A 1951 Life magazine article stated that Goff was one of the few US architects whom Frank Lloyd Wright considers creative, scorns houses that are boxes with little holes. Beautiful. To receive the, the, the compliment from Frank Lloyd Wright <laughs> was not a little thing because Frank Lloyd Wright was usually very, very harsh towards other architects. In fact, so much so that at one moment he wrote or he said, nothing wrong with architecture except the architects. But he didn't include, I imagine, Bruce Goff uh, in, in, in that uh, understanding. Unfortunately, or amusingly, he had a very, very, very strange taste in choosing his shirts, as you can see. And this is, this is just one picture. I mean, this man had the most extravagant shirts uh, available uh, then and now, and maybe also in the future. He loved ex eccentric, uh, eccentric shirts. What can we do? Here is another one. And he was already at a certain age, you know? I mean, look at this shirt. You know, I, I mean, I wouldn't wear it even alone in my room. And he is here with a microphone, probably in front of a large audience. He loved eccentric shirts. What can you do? Uh, but here he's more, uh, you know, well, he's younger, he's more discreet, more, uh, you know, uh, anyway. But here we are. I am asking you the question. On the left is Bruce Goff, but who is the lady on the right? Do you know? Well, she's not a lady. <laughs> she's frankly right. Well, he is Frank Lloyd Wright, but can you imagine? I mean, when I first saw this picture, I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe that the person on the right was Frank Lloyd Wright. But I love the expression of Bruce Goff and even the expression of Frank Lloyd Wright. And 
you can tell these two people there was admiration and there was respect uh, there was affection you know he was the prodigal son who you know arrived himself at a certain stature i'm not, i'm not talking about it physically although you can tell he has an impressive stature, at least compared to Frank Lloyd Wright, who is my new school here. Well, he's probably around 90, close to 90 here. Whatever, the greatness of the human spirit uh, goes beyond the stature of us, uh, you know, uh, physical centimeters or whatever, and uh, even beyond age. I like the, the expression of Briscoe, and I like the expression of Frank Lloyd Wright together. Here they are. <laughs> Very nice. I, I mean, what is this thing on the head of Frank Lloyd Wright? Uh, you know, he, he, I mean, look, he, he was still, uh, you know, uh, he had, uh, you know, this, uh, I mean, this, this is not usually, you know, used by a man, rather by ladies, but <laughs> he used it. I guess the feminine side of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was uh, acting out. Good for him. I mean, after all, he built more than 500 buildings and designed more than 1,000. How many people in the world um, can claim a similar, per a similar performance? Drawings, drawings by the exotic man with the most extravagant shirts in the world, Bruce Goff. Bruce Goff, who didn't study architecture in a school, and but he became the dean of an architecture school. Splendid. Bravo. Look at his uh, this uh, plan of a house. Uh, it's this one. Um, we'll, we'll look at some buildings he built. In a certain way, he was more eccentric than Franklin Wright. He built some very exotic buildings. Why? Because he listened to his own inner genius. This man was made for architecture. Who made him for architecture? Not man, but God, or fate, or nature, or I don't know, the gods. You, you can use various names. But it wasn't man who made Bruce Goff an architect. He made himself because with, it was within himself the propensity towards becoming an architect. Now we arrive at probably his best work, which unfortunately was sold piece by piece by the son of the, the initial owner of the house. This was a masterpiece, this house. And believe it or not, in a criminal way, and I, I don't know, maybe a book should be written, a psychoanalytical book, why the son of the owner of the house who commissioned Bruce Goff to build it, sold it piece by piece. It doesn't exist any longer. He probably made a lot of money because it was a famous house and he sold it piece by piece. It is probably a, a, a case worthy of, of a psycho, psychoanalytical research. Maybe some kind of a revenge against the father, the revolt against the father, you know, to dismantle the house which you know a symbolized the father very interesting but uh, it's a sad thing yes very very sad uh, this was the house built by bruce goff and here are tourists uh, visiting it before the prodigal son not the prodigal son quite the opposite he the the, the criminal son the the revolted and revolting son uh, sold it and look at the interior, look at how the exterior enters the, the room, you know, we, including water. And uh, it's, it's a magical house. Well, in a, in a special climate, of course, in Arizona, but uh, um, still a, a beautiful house. Now, maybe if he studied in an architecture school, he would have built a cubicle white house and that was it. But fortunately, Bruce Goff uh, listened to the advice of Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright and never went to school. And that's why his imagination was, was free. He, he had no inhibitions. 
And sometimes I, I think if, if there were no architecture schools in the world, could we imagine what kind of architecture the world would have had or would have? Probably some very exotic, I'm sure that there would have been also terrible uh, buildings built, yes. But also probably because of uneducated architects, probably some astonishing buildings would, would have come into being like this one and this is the only, is not the only one that he built also you know it's funny that this man who never studied in an architecture school became the dean of an architecture school based on on the brilliance of his work That is in a country where meritocracy still finds a way to assert itself, because not all countries allow meritocracy to uh, show up its face. Especially those countries which value diplomas more than the brilliance of a work. Now here everything is a creation, everything. It's a creation of an uninhibited man, probably wearing a, a very extravagant shirt. This is another house he built. I will show you several. And his work is actually, uh, he's not repeating himself. These buildings are still standing. I mean, this building is still standing. This is another house in the forest. Brusgov, another house, Brusgov. Now, really, if we look at these uh, walls and compare them with our placid white walls, which ones are richer? I would say that these ones, no? Brusgov, 1904-1982. So we saw this house, which does not exist any longer uh, too badly. This is another house he built. <laughs> some, some of these houses indeed are very, very strange, you know, like, like this one. But uh, imagination itself can be strange sometimes or often. And uh, I think imagination, you know, even for a scientist like Einstein, Imagination was more important than knowledge. And he valued a lot imagination. And I think we should value imagination as well and not restrict it. No, not restrict it. We shouldn't restrict imagination. This is another beautiful house, very strange, no? a very unique house. I, I'm not sure if it still exists. Or it was uh, ruined and then it was rebuilt. Uh, the interior of one of these house, of one of his houses, um, you know, very special things happen, like that child playing on that floating uh, or flying almost island uh, within the large living room. This is a center for Japanese art that he built, uh, I think, together with Bart Prince. Another brilliant uh, uh, North American architect. Yes, that's what it is, I think, in Los Angeles. Uh, another house by, uh, by Bruce Goff. Uh, the plan has some similarities to some plans by, uh, or some houses designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, again, we saw this building, uh, we saw it. And here you see a few images of various buildings he built. Uh, Bruce Goff. Another interesting house of an uninhibited man with a very exotic shirt. This one also interesting, 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 and in my opinion, more interesting than anything Lacaton and Vassal did or do. Why? Because it's a freer spirit. That's why. 
and yet rigorous and yet geometrical. It, it, this is not a disordered building. It's not. You can tell it. It has the coherence of an organized organism. A church. Where are the clerics of this world to look at it? It's a church. It's a church, this one. Yes, it might look like an agricultural kind of device or building, but it's a church. And it's a view from, from the interior. Um, sorry about this building. Again, uh, another house built by, he built a lot of houses, but not only private houses, uh, Bruce Goff. But you can see this is very different from this house, isn't it? I actually am tempted to say that he was freer than Frank Lloyd Wright. His imagination was wilder somehow. A good building this also. I mean, really, the one who wouldn't like it is someone who is timid. Look at this. I mean, this is a house by Bruce Goff. And this is another house by Bruce Goff. They have nothing in common. But they are both buildings by Bruce Goff. Uh, back to the house that was dismantled by the hateful uh, son. Uh, this one, <laughs> this one, this one again, uh, this one also again. Um, yes, maybe the order of presenting his works is not uh, the best. I have to look at it again for the next presentation on him. Anyway, another house. This one also different. Look at this thing here. What is it? You know, whatever it is, but it is enticing. It is interesting. It is provocative. Hope, Hope Well Baptist Church in Edmond, Ohio. Hey, look at this. We, we already saw a picture of it or two. Uh, I like it. You know, it's in Ohio. It's uh, you know, in a flat land with, uh, with a lot of agriculture and so on. And uh, uh, it's dedicated to God, but it's made by man. And it, it, I like the fact that it has an industrial look. A God, after all, loves industriousness, doesn't he? Or should love industriousness, after all, for God's sake. Because we are. <laughs> We are, you know, once we were, uh, you know, uh, banished from the paradise, we had to work, you know, to, to survive. What can we do? And look at the result of work, the work of man. You know, uh, he put his extravagant shirt on him and he designed this, I would say, very nice church. Okay, and now we'll end the day with, uh, uh, in a way, the culmination of the day with a young Japanese uh, architect who is uh, provoking us from the present, and that is So Fujimoto. So Fujimoto, who refuses to conform, just as all great architects refuse to conform. And I think we should learn from them and say no to conformity just as they did. I have here a presentation on both Fujimoto and Ishigami, but I only present uh, Fujimoto uh, today. Look what Albert Einstein says. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. I totally agree. I totally agree. We became so, so uh, uh, enslaved by the servant that we forgot the intuitive mind. So again, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. And the rational mind, which seduces us a lot these days, is a faithful servant. Nothing more than a faithful servant. We have created a society 
that honors the servant instead of honoring the intuitive mind and in his words and has forgotten the gift that is the intuitive mind bravo albert einstein you talked like a poet uh, but before i talk a little bit about um, fujimoto i want to say something about japan the land of the rising star sun uh, the exceptionalism of japan is probably connected also with the fact that it is indeed the land of the rising sun main shrine building naiku built for amaterasu the sun goddess in europe the sun is a male and the moon is the female but in japan the sun is a goddess is a female and her name is amaterasu here she is uh, and here she is uh, in, a, in a woodcut or in two woodcuts. And uh, the, the, the shrine, the Ise shrine, are formidable, which are dedicated to Amaterasu. Uh, uh, it's truly really a formidable primal archetypal architecture uh, uh, and dedicated to the, the, to the uh, primordial goddess, the sun goddess. Amaterasu. There are two, uh, what is very interesting here is that there are two adiacent pieces of land. On one land, there is the temple, I mean, several buildings. And the other land, piece of, I mean, the other plot of land is empty. And every, I think, 11 or 20 years, what is built on one plot of land is rebuilt identically on the, on the empty plot of land. And then uh, what was previously existing is demolished. So for more than 1,100 years or so, this process continued alternately every 20 years. And today, we still have on that plot of land, on one of the top, uh, plots of land, the architecture exactly as it was built 1,100 years ago. This is just before uh, one plot of land is emptied. And then uh, 20 years, like here, we see these are new. This would be destroyed. And then 20 years later, what is here is rebuilt identically on this uh, uh, site. And then uh, uh, this is emptied. So it goes alternately like this, I think every 20 years. Look here. I mean, it's it's very moving, really. You know, it's 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 continuity. It's continuity, uh, uh, and it, it's it's really about a great great uh, reverence for uh, for Amaterasu. It's a splendid architecture. I have a beautiful book which is was edited by uh, uh, um, uh, Kenzo Tange, the great modern uh, Japanese uh, architect. And uh, in my opinion, this is one of the best architectures of the world ever. It's an Ise shrine, uh, a Shinto sh uh, shrine. Uh, you know, I, I don't know very well why I felt like uh, talking a little bit about this before talking about Fujimoto. But because in Japan, even the most extravagant gestures, architectural or otherwise, are rooted in a deep, reverence in uh, towards myth towards the the oldest traditions of the country and this is something uh, very few people on this earth have so you see here the two the two sides uh, it's possible that here this little little building is actually containing or, or symbolizing the, the very essence of Am Amaterasu. I, I, I'm not an expert in the matter. I should read more about it, but whatever it is, it's, 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 it's mysteriously very, very important. Uh, if you are so kind, please turn off the microphone. Uh, thank you. Please turn on the microphone. Uh, thank you. And here you will see an image with the Empress of, uh, of uh, Japan. Uh, uh, well, the picture is not great, but uh, anyway, uh, visiting the Ise Shrine. Now I'll show a few examples of Yukio-e art. 
because I think it's an art that is uh, uh, still influencing artistic expressions in Japan. And uh, I talked about a little bit about Frank Lloyd Wright, who had a great collection of Yukio-e woodcuts. Uh, uh, these, these were woodcuts made from mid 18th century to mid 19th century or so. And they had great, beautiful artists Artists who signed sometimes with 15, 20 pseudonyms, like he, like uh, Hokusai, for example. You know, these people were unbelievable. For them, the signature itself didn't matter much. They signed their, you know, names uh, with various names uh, all the time. So, you know, they, they were not stuck in the in the fetishism relating to a, to a certain uh, signature. I remember a great film by Akira Kurosawa, The Bodyguard, where a great, uh, um, a great, um, you know, uh, samurai is asked by someone, "What is your name?" And he looks through the window of the room he was in, and he sees a field with flowers, and he says, "I am the field of flowers," and he names the flowers. I forgot the name of the flower. So he. He took the name of the context, the temporal context, and the spatial context he, he found himself in. You know, this, this beautiful, in a way, depersonification, but which paradoxically had a, an amplification of, 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 uh, 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 of his personality in an indirect way. I, I, I don't know if I explained well. It's something which I, I think Europeans or Western people have some difficulties to uh, you know, maybe even comprehend. But uh, anyway, Yukio e art. Yesterday I was looking at some information about the great Japanese uh, woodcut artist Utamaro. I don't know if you know, but you know, Japan until mid 19th century was a feudal island, uh, you know, closed, introverted. And uh, the, the, these great artists were discovered by European artists. In what way? From what I read, uh, you know, some French artists, some of the famous ones, Manet, Monet, Degas, and so on, they bought fish, fish that came from Japan, wrapped up in beautiful woodcuts. <laughs> you know, the Japanese sent fish to Europe, and sometimes they, they wrapped up the, the fish with these incredible woodcuts. So these artists who recognized immediately beauty and genius discovered gr the great genius of the Yukio e art in Japan. That's what I read. And it's very moving because these great geniuses actually of Japanese art, they didn't care about genius. They didn't care about oak frame around the artwork. They suspended these woodcuts from the uh, bent branches of the trees and from the frames of the windows, they wrapped fish. I mean, I don't know if themselves. In other words, it was this kind of relaxed attitude towards towards the very, uh, you know, uh, essence of, of the, not just their work, but the, the, also their life. Maybe that's why the Japanese live so long, because they actually don't care so much about their lives. I read this, actually, that they are, they have the most impressive longevity, exactly because they don't live, they don't value their life too much. And I guess death says, wait a minute, you know, this person is not afraid of me, so I should visit him or her later, you know. Uh, I guess, I don't know what death thinks. Anyway, back to, back to the beautiful woodcuts, which I repeat, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright loved woodcuts. And sometimes he even paid his um, employees with woodcuts because he wouldn't have the money to pay them a salary. So he gave them, uh, you know, Japanese woodcuts from his extensive collection. I mean, the, the parts of his collection which didn't uh, um, uh, uh, vanish in a terrible fire that uh, uh, destroyed uh, a good part of his collection, uh, Thalias and uh, East. Anyway. Also strange that Frank Lloyd Wright, who was so fond of fire and uh, within his uh, domestic buildings, he always placed the, the fireplace at the center, was punished by the god, gods of fire or the god of fire twice. And in the, the first one, the first uh, 
um, you know, uh, tragedy. He lost the woman he loved and he had two sons. They were not his sons. They were the sons of um, her, her sons from uh, the, marriage, the previous marriage. And the second time he lost a good part of the collection of the Yukio -E art that we look at now. Anyway, this is, uh, let's rush a little bit because we still have to talk about Su Fujimoto and I don't want to lose too many of you here in the process. I just thought of, you know, going obliquely to Su Fujimoto through a few words about Amaterasu and the beauty of the Yukio -E art, the floating world, because this is what Yukio -E means, the floating world. We should not forget these words, the floating world, because in a way it connects very much with what Fujimoto does, indeed, the floating world. This might be Utamaro. Uh, I don't know Japanese, but uh, somehow uh, it seems to be Utamaro, uh, a great, great, uh, great artist himself. Anyway. Um, They love beauty, obviously. That was it. They love beauty and they created beauty. Fujimoto, Su Fujimoto, a very interesting young Japanese architect. Here he is, Su Fujimoto Architects, Tokyo. And I know a young Romanian architect who works for Su Fujimoto in Paris. She graduated from uh, the University of Architecture and Urbanism on Minku. And she is now in Paris uh, working for him, for Fujimoto. Uh, here he is. I love these Japanese, you know, they, they work very, very, very hard. I work in, myself about two years for a, for a Japanese firm in New York. And I know they work very, very hard, but they also are playful, you know, and uh, this combination between hard work and playfulness pays off. Primitive future, these are his words. They seem to be oxymoronic, no? I mean, what do you mean primitive future? But yes, it, it's a primitive future. It's, a, it's, a, it's looking both ways. You look forward by looking backwards and you look backwards by looking forward. So it's a primitive future between the cave and the nest, other words by him. The Nebula Serpentine Gallery in London, 2013. When are we going to have a Romanian architect who is invited to build a serpentine gallery? Well, uh, this was the initial sketch. <laughs> you know, uh, of course, if you would go with something like this to your atelier in school, you will be dismissed. What is this nonsense? But this nonsense, so-called nonsense, relates to that intuitive mind that Albert Einstein wrote about. You know, although the intuitive mind of Su Fujimoto is not totally divorced from the rationalities of the rational mind, because you can see kind of horizontals and verticals, but it's also uh, foggy, you know, it's, 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 it's almost a Cartesian system that wants to destroy itself, to dissolve itself. And then uh, he transformed it into a buildable structure and built it was. And here it is, or here it was for a year because that's what they do with a serpentine uh, pavilion. They uh, dismantle it after one year and move it somewhere. It's still a rational system. It's still based on, on the Cartesian grid, but he tried to problematize it, to, uh, to sabotage it. And uh, it worked. White steel and polycarbonate. That's how this was built. Uh, and uh, here we have an example of his attempt to, uh, to sabotage the predictable uh, relationship between the horizontal and the vertical, between the slab and the, and the, and, and the wall, and uh, uh, to create an, uh, um, some kind of an obliqueness uh, where an intermediate uh, plane uh, uh, find its way in between the vertical and the horizontal. And these are the steps where you can also sit on, you can ascend uh, 
on, or you can descend on, and so on. You see, like in this sketch. So this is the Serpentine Pavilion by Su Fujimoto uh, in, in, in London. Well, in essence, it's an attempt to, uh, to, to um, bring the irrational in a way into the um, rational system. I don't know, uh, you know, this uh, update from Zoom is making me crazy. Now I see here an announcement, set up professional audio and audio settings. I don't know what this is. It's disturbing my, uh, my, my presentation. Uh, stay away from updates. Updates are always trouble, always, you know, uh, always. Now I can't get rid of this. It's, I, I feel doomed, you know, is this thing here? Okay, I see an X, thank God. But I don't see an X for the other thing here to eliminate it at the top. Anyway, we continue. The Serpentine uh, Pavilion in, uh, in London by uh, Su Fujimoto. Well, look at this, you know, I'm so happy that it moves. It means the update didn't uh, destroy everything. So, <laughs> you know, it's like a virtual trip to London uh, to, to see this thing which does not exist any longer there. Su Fujimoto. In my opinion, not everything is perfect in his case because I think he's still somehow, in as much as he tries to escape the coordinates of uh, Cartesianism, he's not totally uh, able to do it, I would say. But, but this being said, there are qualities in his work. So this is a tower in Bordeaux, which he proposed together with uh, Lene Roussel, uh, a wooden mixed-use uh, tower. Uh, I don't know if it was built or if it will be built. It's, it was a project at the time when I made this presentation. Um, he's, uh, as I said, he has an office now in Paris. So he builds in, in, in France. And, uh, you know, it's not, we could say he, he is lucky. No, no, it's not that he's lucky. He made his luck, okay? Uh, it's you know, you, you can have the similar luck if you become equally relevant in architecture. But in order to do that, you need to be very, very creative, sometimes, sometimes audaciously so. Uh, otherwise, you will not arrive there. It's impossible. This is a, a construction inhabitable nomadic structure for a Parisian art fair. This is in front of the Louvre. Again, we see the we see the grid, we see the Cartesian uh, system, but we also see the surrealist attempt to escape gravity. And there are, I mean, look at this, it, it, you know, how could this be possible? This cube is floating, is, is, is what's going on here? They seem to be, you know, uh, uh, def defeating uh, uh, gravity. You know, what is going on here? Anyway, he built it in front of the Louvre. Yes, why? Well, because he's lucky. Of course, I am sarcastic now. And look at this, it's almost like in a three-dimensional uh, representation within a, build, uh, a painting by Salvador, Salvador Dali. It's built of matter by an architect, but is, 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 is uh, uh, you know, contradicting uh, gravity and is uh, perplexing the eye. I mean, look at this here. How is it that it doesn't fall? These Japanese are so, I mean, these Japanese architects are so lucky. You know. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, Su Fujimoto in front of the Louvre in Paris, uh, drawing a sketch, a plan, plans, uh, views, built, built work. 
Stephen Hall said, if you have idealism in you, let it out, express it. Well, this is what so Fujimoto did. He had and has idealism in you, he expresses it, he works hard for it, and then the gods of luck say, wait a minute, so Fujimoto, uh, considering your efforts, we decided to send towards you uh, a naval, uh, I mean, a, a vehicle, a celestial uh, vehicle with a lot of luck. So Fujimoto unveils visions for Paris of tomorrow. This is a project he did for a competition for a large office building with a village on top of it. So look at this. It's the revenge of the village, of the rural. Here we have the urban with its phallic uh, uh, majesty. And then we have the, uh, the rather horizontal office uh, building with a village on top of it. So the village is taking revenge on the mega structures of the present. Interesting idea. Uh, but it's not only his. Uh, there are attempts in this, uh, in this field uh, from various places, including in his case, uh, he, he did it himself in California at a smaller scale than what we see here. It's not only the revenge of the village, it's also the revenge of the tree or of nature. Because look, nature now is coming upwards and it should, because we need nature. We need the trees, we need the oxygen, and we need the beauty of nature. And we even need the wildness of nature, rewilding our lives. Yes, we should rewind, our, rewind and re, re, rewild our, our lives through bringing nature, bring, 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 bring Lilith, the rebellious woman, back into our lives and also, uh, you know, back hopefully into our souls. Hopefully. I mean, look at the buildings here and look at the building here. It's a difference, isn't it? You know, uh, the building is ship-like and on top of the ship, we have nature, we have the trees. L'Arbre Blanc, Montpellier, France. It's a, it's a project he did for Montpellier and I think this one is built now. Uh, well, in my opinion, a tree should never be white, but, you know, being that this was a, a metaphorical tree a building, uh, maybe, maybe, although I would have liked it to be a little bit different, but it wasn't me who designed it, it was him, so uh, let's accept the situation. But all in all, it's an attempt to bring nature back back to life, back to the urban life, back to the city, uh, the city that alarmingly is uh, reducing nature and is uh, increasingly uh, covering the, the, the earth with asphalt and cement and concrete and steel and glass. What? But we see the trees now uh, climbing on the facades of the buildings everywhere not just here in Paris or Montpellier, not just in France, not just by Sofujimoto. All over the world, there is a clear uh, determination on the side of nature to come back. And, and uh, of course, with the help of human beings, because we are uh, frightened by uh, the possible consequences of doing uh, otherwise. So here it is, you know, the primal, uh, the intuitive mind that Einstein talked about, and then, uh, you know, the approximation, the architectural approximation deriving from the, uh, the first sketch that the intuitive mind uh, produced. The white tree, uh, L'Arbre Blanc, Blanc in Montpellier, France, by Su Fujimoto. I still prefer the green trees, but anyway, new learning center in Paris, Ecole Polytechnique. This, in my opinion, is not such a great uh, work. Sometimes he can be tiringly uh, obsessed by whiteness. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a problem, but uh, you know, let's hope he doesn't build it. Too much whiteness, in my opinion. I, I kind of miss Bruce, Bruce Goff, don't you? I mean, Bruce Goff worked with stones, with exotic stones, with, uh, you know, uh, with the earth in a way. 
But the new generation of uh, Japanese uh, architectural heroes, they love whiteness. Ishigami loved whiteness until very recently. Uh, Kazuyo Sejima loves whiteness. Toyo Ito loves whiteness, sometimes at least. Fujimoto loves whiteness. Uh, but this interior, for example, is not glorious, let's confess. But anyway, uh, it's his birthday, so let's talk nicely about him. We are paying homage to him. We are saying happy birthday to him. And now we arrive at the geometric forest. He loves oxymorons, you know, like the primitive forest. Now the geometric forest. Um, again, we see this tension between reason and unreason between the predictability of the Cartesian system and something that opposes it in quest for freedom. But a freedom which does not reject a certain level of organization, just like in the pavilion, uh, the serpentine pavilion that we just saw. Tokyo. Uh, Actually, about this work, and I was supposed to do some research. I, I'm not so sure it's by him. Uh, that's why I'm, I, I will be a little bit uh, silent here. Uh, maybe it is by him. Uh, maybe it is not by him. I'm a little bit um, uh, questioning if indeed this is by him. But there are elements of his architecture, the broken rational system, the climbing of the, of the nature on the building, the whiteness, and so on. I would not insist though too much on this building because there are a few other architects who would kind of work in this way. It might be his or it might be belong to some other architect because it is in a way a new Japanese school of architecture. And Fujimoto, this might be his though. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, double check. Anyway. Uh, what is very interesting is, is what is happening here. It's very interesting that this is happening in Japan. I mean, when we think of Japan, we think of an extreme organization. But look what's going on here. I mean, the gods of chaos seem to have enjoyed themselves here. You know, these wires. My God, if this would have happened in Romania, I would have said, of course, you know, we are in Romania. But this is in Tokyo. This is in Japan, you know, it's incredible in a way, you know, they, there was no other way to, this makes me think of, of Louis Kahn, who was always trying to contain the possible disasters, aesthetical and otherwise, of letting the pipes and the cables get, uh, cables get wild. Well, that's exactly what is happening here. The pipes and the cables are getting wild. <laughs> You know, it's almost the revenge of Dionysus. Uh, very interesting. And I, I saw other examples like this, you know, from, from Tokyo and from Japan. Prototype for a shared living space for the Tokyo real estate company. Somebody said, we don't have any longer exhibitions about um, uh, housing or public housing. Well, they do it in Japan. And I, I like this proposal by Fujimoto. It's uh, kind of a... It's actually not very, very, very dissimilar from uh, uh, the apartment building, uh, the old apartment building where I was born in Sibiu, uh, an old house connected with bridges and uh, exterior, exterior corridors. Uh, um, you know, uh, there an architecture without architect, here an architecture with an architect. But uh, it's all uh, about trying to honor public life, but also to provide intimacy. So uh, some kind of uh, an interplay between uh, uh, privateness and publicness. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I like it. It's, it's uh, uh, of course, this was done just for an exhibition. But, um, you know, uh, if you compare with, uh, you know, public housing on blocks of flats all over the world, this is, a, a, I would say, a better alternative. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it has variety, it has, uh, you know, interesting shapes. Uh, and I imagine on those corridors and, and bridges, uh, people meet, well, not now with the pandemic so much, but let's hope the pandemic will go away. 
Anyway, this was the proposal of, uh, this might be actually on the left by Shigeru Ban about, I will talk about whom I will talk tomorrow. I think it is by Shigeru Ban. This is, uh, this is the Su Fujimoto. House vision. Yes, the Japanese still think about this. House before house, this I like very much. I like this project and I like its naming. A house, the house before the house, house before house. Look at this, you know, freedom. Freedom, you know, these uh, white cubicles, you know, uh, floating uh, uh, with the, the functionalist would, would, would scream because the, the sloping angle of the stair is not the correct one. Neufert would, uh, would, would uh, get mad in his grave. Uh, professors and assistants who scream at you, how am I going to bring the, the piano into the room? But why are we have to, why do we have to bring the piano in every room? You know, I, I mean, these Japanese, look, it's just, a, it's just a little space with a bed, okay? It's fine, we don't need to bring the piano there, nor the huge refrigerator. It's just a little room, okay? It's fine. If the stair is not very comfortable, that's fine too. It's just, there are just a few steps. That's it. But look at this. The building is, uh, is uh, playing hide and seek with the trees. And the trees do the sim similar thing with the building. With the, it's, it's a confusion in a way, you know? Where does the building begins and where does it end? And the same question goes for nature, for the trees. And look at the plant. Playful, yes, playful. It is playful. And I think Amaterasu, wherever she is, smiles in, uh, with, uh, with uh, acceptance. And, uh, and look at the Japanese, the two young Japanese. They are smiling too, together with Amaterasu. Why is it that the Japanese experiment so much? Look at this, look at this ladder here, you know? This would never be accepted in a country like ours. What, you know, this is not civilized. This is, uh, this is uh, so dangerous. How, how come uh, one of the most civilized nations in, on earth, that is the Japanese, can do it? You know, and this was also done in Romanian villages many times in the past. Why can't we do it again? Well, because of fear, because of uh, timidity, because of neifer, because of uh, high education, you know, lots of uh, dogmas and so on. But people who are free and playful, uh, like Fujimoto, who is now building in various countries in the world, uh, they can do it. Look, they can do it. <laughs> you know, it pays off, in other words. Look at the plan. Uh, I, am a, I am envious, I, I confess. Look at this house, it was built, okay? This was built. Can you believe it? I mean, can you believe it that this house was built on, on the top of the sloping roof of another house identical and or almost identical underneath and so on? It was built like this, not identically, look at the section. Look at this, this house, is sitting on the top part of the roof of the little house underneath. You know, are these Japanese mad? Yes, they are. Beautifully so. As Plato said, there are four kinds of madness. To be in love, to be a poet, to be a prophet, and to be clinically mad. Well, maybe Su Fujimoto is uh, mad at power four. Maybe, let's hope for him that he's also in love. Why is it that these Japanese can be so playful? <laughs> and why is it that we can't? Something like this would be totally inconceivable in our schools of architecture. No, totally unacceptable. <laughs> but they built it in Japan. And this is the plan. Uh, <laughs> you know, where order and disorder shake hands and become good friends. And this is the house. And look, at, uh, unfortunately, I should have had more pictures, 
uh, and I, I plan to do to, to put more pictures here, but I, I got carried away with the other people. Please search if you are uh, if you love intrigue and if you love to be provoked, search on the web because you'll find many pictures. What you saw on this model was built in Japan by Su Fujimoto architects. Anyway. And I mean, look at these Japanese here, you know, it's, I really envy them. They are, I think they are beautiful. They, they, they reinvent humanity in a way, you know, they, through their playfulness, they're not the only ones. Of course, the Dutch also do similar experiments. These are countries we can learn from if we open our hearts and our minds. And if we trust the intuitive mind that Albert Einstein talked about, the Jenga house in Japan, another example which would exasperate the professors of the, in the architecture schools, at least in some parts of the world. What is this nonsense? There are no rooms. There are no walls. There are no floors here, for God's sake. How could you do something like this, Su Fujimoto? Are you mad? Yes, sir, I am mad. Mad at power four, as Plato would have said. Look at the rigor of the drawings, the magnificent Japanese rigor, which I wish I would be able to have myself, but I don't. But anyway, I appreciate it. I love it. It's very, very rigorous, and at the same time, very, very free. You know, it's it's musical work, it's abstract work, it's courageous work, it's a cube in essence towards the outside, but the inside is eroded by the beautiful madness of Su Fujimoto and also the beautiful madness of the clients who commissioned this work, who lived in this work and live in this work. You'll see some pictures. It's beautiful. Look at them. Look at them, you know, why is it that these Japanese enjoy themselves in such an environment? You know, this one is contemplating the sky. This one is contemplating Zoom or maybe taking part right now in our uh, gathering here. You know, uh, someone here at a lower level maybe is preparing a coffee or something. And they all sabotage the predictability of the wall and the slab or the floor. You know, <laughs> why not? Why should life be only morose and predictable and stern and dogmatic? Look at them. She smiles at him. He smiles at her. He reads, he read, he reads her a poem. She is bringing him a soup or something. The music is probably on. And the sun is smiling too, meaning Amaterasu. Why are we the, the ones who are truly mad are us? Like Fernando Pessoa, the great Portuguese poet said, not the one who writes love poems is mad. Although there is ridiculousness in writing love poems, he recognized himself. But the one who is actually who, who is actually ridiculous is the one who doesn't write the life love, love poems. And I would agree with Fernando Pessoa, and we should always agree with the great poets. Yes, I mean, I look at this picture and I envy these people and I envy the architect who betrayed their laws of predictability and asserted the freedom of humankind. Bravo to him and to them. How's Anne in Oita? This one is a little bit uh, uh, stiff in my opinion, but even this one has some interesting things. He built a house within a house within a house. Uh, uh, in my opinion, towards the outside is a little too big, but the idea to, to, to sabotage a, a linear or, or, or a simplistic relationship between the inside and the outside is a good one. So we see here the little cube and the bigger cube. So the little cube is within a larger cube and then into an even larger cube. So what this would have been the outside is actually also the inside. Is the outside of this cube, but is the inside of the other cube, and so on. So it's a play with the interior and the exterior. 
um, experiments. Not all experiments are equally successful. He knows it, we know it, but the important thing is that he's not stuck into what is predictable. He explores various things. Uh, and again, you know, Japan is unstoppable. Uh, is unstoppable in various fields. And uh, it's exactly because of this, well, they are rooted. And that's why I started with Amaterasu. Even when they are the most eccentric, they are rooted. They are rooted in a past which is, uh, 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 you know, very, very uh, uh, profound and deep. So you see, it's about inside and outside. Uh, on the left, we have the conventional house, as he called it. Uh, on the right, the so-called future house, where the, the inside and the outside uh, uh, blur uh, the distinctions between themselves. In my opinion, one of, not, not one of his best experiments, but we move on. We, we move on. If you don't make mistakes, like, like uh, again, Albert Einstein said, if you, if you never made a mistake, it means you never tried anything new. Once you try something new, you might fail, um, you know, more or less, but it's okay. You move forward. The Nachhaus, this one also, it's an exercise in, uh, in, uh, in uh, embracing improbability. You know, it's, yes, it is too white, but look at these people, you know, it's, I mean, they sit on top of the building. They, I don't know, maybe these people were brought just to, to, to take pictures of them. One thing is for sure, the building was built. Uh, was built by these uh, sons and daughters of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And uh, uh, they seem to enjoy themselves. Maybe that's why they live the longest on this earth, because they experiment so much and they, they, they are playful. But they also work very hard. I, I read that uh, in Japan, very few people fall in love uh, because, uh, because they are workaholics. Anyway. It's also this communal life, which is so important that they are together. There is this form of togetherness. Now look at this person here and, and this one as well. They're actually sitting on the roof without being afraid of falling. It's incredible. There is no handrail here. And they seem to be relaxed. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, really unbelievable. Look at them. <laughs> They're actually on the roof at the edge of the building. Fujimoto. The infinite possibilities of open field architecture. This is a, a title or a, some wording from a lecture he gave. The infinite possibilities of open field architecture. Uh, yeah. The forest of books. Uh, I want to say about this, but maybe I arrive later at, uh, at some images from a lecture he gave, I think, at Harvard or at Cooper Union. Anyway, the Forest of Books, this is a library he built, uh, but I will arrive at that later. Sorry for not being immediately after the title, Primitive Future, Floating Village. Yes, this is an image from his lecture. Uh, I think he gave it at Cooper Union or Harvard, it doesn't matter. But what you see here on the, on the two screens projected, you see a lady with her legs up, sleeping or taking a rest on, in a you know, rather you know, a difficult uh, physical context. And he said that he was visiting uh, Vietnam and he entered the store, he, he saw this lady and then his idea came to him as an architect to create an architecture where uh, you know, uh, there are no, uh, uh, you know, uh, distances or, or, or there is no significant distance be between the horizontal plane and the vertical plane. And just like in this case, there are transitional steps, boxes, all kinds of things happening. And, 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 and his conclusion was that, that actually this kind of apparently difficult 
crowded, uh, chaotic interior uh, could have uh, beneficial uh, qualities. Uh, and, uh, and indeed it has. I mean, we saw the pavilion, the serpentine pavilion that he built uh, in London uh, and other buildings also, we, we saw a few other things where he was exploring this blurring between the vertical and the horizontal, this fragmentation, which would uh, kind of distort or sabotage the um, rational servant Albert Einstein talked about. And here we see a diagram of that uh, or of this. Uh, you can find, of course, a lot of uh, information. I mean, a lot of lectures and talks about Fujimoto on the web. Now, this is a library in Japan, the Musashino Art University, which was based on a very interesting uh, thought. He said there are two ways in which you can uh, use a library. One is searchability. That is, you have a title in your mind and you enter a library and you go to the librarian and ask for that library and you get a number uh, uh, indicating a shelf and you go straight to that shelf, find the book and then leave. But then he said there is another way to use a library where you get lost through the library and you discover titles you didn't even know existed. And that he called the uh, 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 throwability. So there are two systems, one organized, rational, the other one embracing chains, you know, like chains encounters, hazard. And I think welcoming hazard is important. And he does it. Now, these people might not have had the money after they build a building to also buy the books at least at that time, but it's okay, they will, at least the Japanese can do anything. And, uh, um, but this idea to have a double system, uh, one where the will of the consumer, so to speak, the one who enters a library is honored, and the other one where the so-called consumer of the library goes into the library and allows himself or herself to be lost in the realm of books and just allow chains encounters with other human beings or with books, with titles, with provocations that he didn't plan for. In other words, here there is also an architecture that is unplanned for. And the idea of an accidental architecture seduces me because I think there are virtues, possible virtues in an unplanned for architecture. In the case of Fujimoto, it's a part which is planned, it's a part which is not planned. There are both systems, if I am to use the word system. I guess, you know, he also wanted to bring books to the facade of the building, which is, in my opinion, not necessarily a great idea, but I think they, they, they would be able to treat the glass in a certain way so the light, the natural not light does not affect paper. But this also makes me think of what Victor Hugo said that, that Gutenberg destroyed or the book destroyed the cathedral because until Gutenberg, until the books began to be published uh, you know, through mass production, the message, the narrative was inscribed in size in the walls of the cathedral. And with the, uh, with the, uh, the development of the publishing uh, process and the multiply, multiplication of books, slowly the message inscribed in size in the walls of the cathedral went into the pages of the books. Uh, so in that sense, indeed, the book killed the cathedral. But here we see that the book is coming back to the world. I mean, in, the, in the, this project by, by Fujimoto, the, the way he created these shelves 
on the, the, the shell of the building shows that he's bringing back the narrative, meaning the books literally, explicitly to the world. So in a way, it's, it's the coming back, the revenge of the world, which, which, which misses the inscriptions on it, the book, the narrative. Anyway, to find the unexpected book, encounter unexpected books. This is about welcoming chance encounters with books or with people to, to welcome the unplanned for, to find the unexpected book, to find, to encounter unexpected books, or I would say further unexpected people. It's not to be afraid of, of, of the unplanned for. That's what it is. And welcome the accidents of life and even of knowledge. Why not? Musashino Library, composite drawing and conceptual model where we see the two systems, you know, interlocked into some kind of a strange embrace. Between function and no function, this is also a very interesting, uh, if I am to call it concept of Su Fujimoto, because he understood the values of no function. You cannot plan everything, allow for certain spaces to be functionless. And in those spaces, you allow room for the inhabitants, the users of that space to manifest their inspiration, their willfulness, their capriciousness, you name it, their playfulness, now, this is a public toilet in Ichihara, a garden escape, another interesting provocation from Su Fujimoto, and also for us, because, you know, we, we would think that a, a, public, a toilet in the, in a, outside of the building is a sign of primitiveness and, uh, you know, being, being inadequate. I mean, many villages in Romania still have such, um, you know, toilets, and we think that they should be banished. Well, in one of the most civilized countries in the world, it's happening the opposite. He built this, well, you could say, why is it transparent? Well, I saw pictures also with, uh, with curtains. A train is passing by, but he built this uh, fence around it. Anyway, it is a toilet in a garden. And uh, uh, you see the plan, it's kind of an ellipse almost. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, he said that in an, in an interview or in a, in a lecture that he had this idea when he was in the Arab world and he had a pressing need to, to, to go somewhere for a toilet and someone told him, just, just go over the dunes, which he did. And then he thought of creating something that we in Romania have uh, still have in, in, in many cases in villages. And we are so ashamed of that uh, unpardonable sign of primitiveness. Well, we shouldn't be ashamed. It's actually even very hygienical, you know, uh, not to have it inside the house. Anyway, this is what Su Fujimoto did. It's very elegant, maybe too elegant, and uh, kind of uh, slick. But uh, you see the train is passing by, and this is the, the outdoor uh, toilet that he built. Um, it's only for uh, one sex, uh, for the ladies, I don't know why. And there is uh, next door uh, toilet for, for both sexes, a conventional one, so to speak. But he did, you see it here. And also for, uh, um, you know, handicapped people. But all in all, it's an experiment, uh, you know, you might protest against or you might uh, indulgently, uh, uh, you know, smile at, it's possible. Between architecture and landscape, between furniture and architecture, between inside and outside, between nature and architecture, against the predefining system of modern architecture. And unfortunately, in many schools of architecture of this world, there is still an obsession with the predefining system of modern architecture, which relates to that uh, rational servant, Einstein talked about 
when he said that we constructed a society which values the rational servant instead of honoring the intuitive mind. This again, it's against the predefining system of modern architecture, the supremacy of its majesty, so-called reason, you know, and uh, there are great, great and grave limitations on life, which the rational servant imposes on us. The domadic house, this was, this was also during the lecture, I think at Cooper Union in New York, where he said that after he finished his studies at the, uh, I don't know what school of architecture in Tokyo, uh, he was probably unemployed. I am assuming he was wandering through the streets of Tokyo and he had this idea of a house which has a room here and another room, uh, I don't know, some hundreds of meters uh, to the west and uh, another room uh, 500 meters to the west and or east, uh, south. And in other, in other words, a dispersed house, a nomadic house, he calls it. Very interesting. Architecture's forest. Endless library. Here I'm just going through some of his so-called concepts. I don't like the word concept, but in this case, I use it with uh, being aware of its limitations. How would an architecture as a forest look like? Uh, the endless library. We saw one of the libraries he built. He built two. Searchability and strawability. In other words, the willful search for a book and getting lost within a library, as I already mentioned when I presented that library. And that's it. It's uh, really, uh, um, I, I'm not totally pleased with, uh, with this uh, presentation of Fujimoto. I can do better, but I promise you, the next year I will, I will redo the presentation. Is uh, In the meantime, he, he built more. Uh, and uh, 